But next up, we have uh, Olaf from Crazy Labs, who's uh, going to be talking about uh, the messy middle from trend gamification to profitable hyper casual game. Hi, Olaf. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm Sorry not bad, for the I was unable to unmute for some reason, but here I am. Hello. <laughs> fine. It's absolutely fine. It's to be honest, I would go as far as to say it's normal in Zoom world for it to to take a few minutes to 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 jump in. But yeah. You feeling relaxed? You feeling good? Uh, I feel a bit stressed. It's my first time here, so bear with me. Uh, but I oh, hope don't to worry. Do my best. Don't I'm worry. Busy. Yeah, it's dead relaxed. It's dead calm. Where are you coming at us from? Where are you based at the moment? I'm based in Warsaw, Poland. We have several offices around the world, and this is one of them. So there it is. Great. So what's it there? What about eleven o'clock? Something like that? Yeah, exactly. It's one hour ahead, so it's eleven o'clock. It's not so great weather, weather today, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's better than here in the UK. But uh, but yeah, I, I mean that's nice. Eleven o'clock is a good time. But yeah, don't don't be worried. Don't don't um you know relax. It's fine. It's dead easy. We've got a good audience here this morning. They've got a lot of questions. So yeah, what sure. I'll do is I'll let you share. Have you got um slides to share or anything yeah, like of that? Course. I have my slides yeah. ready. If uh, yeah, this if, is it, I'll want... hit the present button. Well, Not yeah, if you, want to, if you want to start sharing your slides, I'm just going to remind the audience. Uh, yeah, throw some kind words in for Olaf in the chat. Keep the conversation flowing and throw your questions in because, uh, yeah, just to let you know, Olaf, want, Olaf, once you've done your talk, don't worry, I will reappear like magic and we'll just have a chat, go through some of the questions that the audience might have. So, yeah. um, Looking forward yeah. to see you again. <laughs> yeah, over to you, but I'm always here in the background if anything happens, so don't worry too much. Thanks a lot, Sophia. Looking forward to this. I will see you soon. See you soon. All right. So uh, I'm Olaf from Crazy Labs, and I would like to talk about the messy middle, which which is a process that we call between the trend gamification and the profitable hyper casual game product. So I work as a game product owner at Crazy Labs. I help developers who publish games with us to create monetizing game experiences and to optimize the engagement and monetization KPIs to prolong the game profitability time. I also love A-B testing. I do a lot of A-B testing. I'll get to that part in a bit. And a little bit about Crazy Labs. I'll keep it real short. We have several labs. We have people working on hyper casual games. I'm one of those guys. We have guys working on casual games and we have one Lab that is under the radar now, so I cannot talk about it yet. Crazy Labs is top free mobile game publisher developer. We have over 4 billion downloads and we cooperate with 350 developers across the world. And here you can see some of our titles that we brought to the top charts. You can see games like Tone Case, DIY, High Dive, some ASMR games like us, ASMR slicing or soap cutting. We have Puzzle Amaze game, arcade, to run and run, sausage run. And one slide, oops, it didn't go. Okay, now it loaded. Uh, one thing that I often hear recently is that hyper casual, actually, maybe uh, it's a, a bit too late to jump on this train, but to be honest, it's not. This is uh, the genre is growing faster than the gaming industry itself, has almost 20% yearly growth. And it's uh, like one third of all mobile game downloads of industry is coming from hyper casual genre. So definitely, you want to be on this train. The um, entry level is so low, everyone can try to reach this top charts. So let's think what is the game product. I will start with the game itself. So, so let's start with the game. You have an idea for the game with some goal to achieve the mechanics and controls to reach this goal. You'd imagine some theme or chosen the art style, printed a bunch of levels to test the core look, and there it is. But if you put something like this in the App Store, it will not monetize it. You need to build around the game several super important components that will make your game monetize. One of those is, of course, monetization. So you need to think where to put those interstitial locations in a smart way so they are not too intrusive. And uh, what content to look with reward videos. We are trying several new ad types, like non-clickable ads that are not intrusive and they just build 
brands top of minds. Uh, we are trying reward with interstitial, sometimes in apps or subscription models. Then you have a marketing team that is creating new videos. We are always trying to stay on top of trends with doing uh, or implementing custom levels or mechanics to be in those trends. You have uh, then user acquisition team that gets those videos and adjusts the uh, spend budgets or bids according to current carpo because obviously you don't want to spend more money than you're earning because you will be losing money by uh, doing so. They monitor individual sort of source of traffic that creating the chasing the bugs on both platforms, iOS, Android, optimizing low end devices performance. We need to comply with uh, new store regulations and uh, support multiple OS versions. And then there's my favorite, which is analytics. We do a lot of A-B testing. So we measure K engagement KPIs and monetization KPIs. And for instance, in your initial game, you probably had just a bunch of levels, but we try several level funnels. One can be harder, it can be another can be more easy. And then you analyze as display per user and per level. So you can then cherry pick the good performing levels from one funnel, combine it with another level with another funnel, and you have that nice engaging level funnel that will monetize the best. You have App Store optimization team that is uh, testing screenshots, icons, keywords to boost organic users. So basically, the ones that you don't need to pay for. This is super important to um, have those organic users share because it will affect the eCPI. So CPI stays the same. This is what you pay for install, but eCPI considers all the organic users that you don't need to pay for. And if you have significant amount of those guys, you can increase the bits. And then we have the legal department that is chasing the copycat because if you hit the top charts, for sure there will be clones and we need to uh, remove them from store. And the game itself it becomes a bit more complex. Apart, of, apart from primary goal, you need to think about secondary goals to boost retention, like missions. You want to build progression system with some meta game with unlockable content to balance economy. And overall, it becomes a little bit, bit more complex, but without the that very first simple game that you started with, building those components around won't make any sense. So it all starts with the good game idea and the and the um, player engagement. So now let's talk about the messy middle. You always probably will start with a prototype and a good performing video. So you got those. Uh, this nice video with cool game idea, it has a low CPI, and this is a great kickstart. It's uh, fairly difficult to get a profitable CPI, but this is not enough by its own to monetize the game. You need to reach engagement KPIs, and that will be the messy middle part that will only monetize your game. So this session is uh, a bit short, so I decided to put just four guides you may want to uh, follow to and your messy middle process. So one, controls must feel good. This will boost your session length. Two, you need to allow exploration and creativity to boost retention. Three, keep the levels short. It will improve uh, the level flow. Four, monetize player desires in order to boost rewarded videos. So now I will go one after another. Controls must feel good. Otherwise, the show won't go on. This is super important. I put it as the first uh, place. Those hyper casual games are relatively small products, let's say, and everything matters really, really uh, much. So if you have this great video, the player engaged and downloaded the game, but then the controls feel clunky, not responsive, there is a big chance you'll get the instant churn. So this is something you really want to polish, to, um, put efforts in more iterations to make it look good. And as the example here, you can see on the right, uh, this is our game, Soap Capping. Uh, it's this uh, huge hit that was in the top, the top charts a while ago, and it's still crushing uh, the App Store. It's, the image on the left is the initial version of controls we've launched the game with. And we designed the game to be played very slowly. And actually, when you played it slowly, 
it performed very well. All the blocks were kept and cleaned, but uh, players will not work the way you designed the game. They will play all the ways, but the one you designed to, to, to them to do so. So players played fast, and as you can see, it becomes a bit dirty and tedious to clean each level. You needed to perform several strokes or cut to clean the level. And then we've tried uh, in an A-B test the version with improved controls. By the way, I don't mind the different knife visual. It's, uh, it doesn't matter in this uh, KPI test. It's just the video I created. But in the new version with improved controls, group B, we improved the uh, physics collision. You just needed to perform a single stroke to clean the layer. And it improved number of runs by half in day one. By runs, we mean how many players the uh, player has uh, played. So basically, the better controls, the more players the player will play. And it affected the output then by 20% in day one. So this is super important. Then you want to boost retention. So you should allow some exploration there. If you want the players to come back to your game, there must be something more waiting for them to discover. So you want to diversify the levels loop the mechanics feel, to introduce new objects, uh, new mechanics or mini games. But also keep in mind that the players came to your game from the UA video for a reason. They liked this video. So if you go too far from it uh, or oversaturate the initial part of the funnel with those fancy mechanics, because you put so many efforts in them and they are so cool, you put every level to be a little bit different it can work the other way around and the player can turn more faster. So the sweet spot is to pepper those new mechanics here and there in the funnel, just so the player knows that if he or she plays a little bit more, another level more, there will be something more to discover. Also, you can, okay, the slide stuck again. Let's wait for it, but I'll keep talking. So also you can, uh, allow creativity. So of course it doesn't apply to all game genres. I'm still waiting for the slide to load. Uh, but um, if you have some DIY game or creative game, you can literally start with putting just a single level. Of course it's skipping. Okay, this is the slide I wanted to show you guys. Uh, you want to, you can always uh, even look one single level and if you allow the player to alter it in different ways so it looks very different from level to level even though it is a single level you can still get a nice retention out of it but as i said probably it's not applicable in all uh, genres so when you can something to consider then um, you may want to keep the levels short the levels should not feel tedious to complete and by levels i don't necessarily mean the levels uh, from level start to level end screen. Because for instance, in simulation games like Human Scout People or um, Tie-Dye or Palm Case DIY, you have several steps to complete the level. But every one of those should feel snappy. And uh, there should be like a nice flow that doesn't feel tedious for the player to complete. You want to reduce number of taps required in UX. So if there's some process that uh, is completed by the player, do not require him to hit next button because every button in the level in the UX flow will toss a little bit higher churn in the in the funnel. And the side effect, let's put it straight. This is a business uh, model. The side effect of it is showing more interstitials because if you finish the level or steps faster, you have the opportunity to show the interstitial. Doesn't, it doesn't mean that we show those ads every time. Absolutely not. We don't want that. We, don't, we want to engage the players, but this gives you the opportunity to show it. So then you can fine tune, fine -tune it remotely using some ad profile to show interstitials in a soft profile that even if there is some location, don't show it because this will for sure get your usage down and uh, you need to be careful and consider the end result of it. Mm, but you can also try and compare with more aggressive profile, profiles and see how it performs. So in the example here on the right, what we did is we matched two steps of scalp people. At the bottom, you can see that there was initially a step where you needed to drill the eyes first and the mouth and confirm it. And then only you could scalp the whole head. So we've combined it 
combine them together. You could do this at once. And also we've removed the delay from the tool itself. So this is something about controls I mentioned before. And as you can see, it uh, got nice improvement in ARPU. It just felt more snappy. The players felt more in control. It felt more creative and less tedious to complete this level. So definitely try to keep, keep the levels short. And then monetize player desires. This is something to consider when you are thinking about rewarded videos. So you always want to create the content the players want to unlock for another video. It shouldn't be brute force. It should be never mandatory to complete the level, but it should something like an, a meaningful addition to the gameplay. So something that you really want to unlock and you are not forced to do this. So as you can see in this example on the right, there is a target image of the sculpture. I need to sculpt absolutely not a celebrity. I have no idea who is this. And there is a very characteristic critical prop uh, that you can obtain. You can apply it to your sculpture, but you need to watch an RV, which is a reward that video. And players don't mind absolutely watching the RVs in such scenario. They, this doesn't have any drawbacks in engagement PPS, actually the otherwise. If it's designed in a way that it's meaningful for the gameplay, the players watch those surveys and it's completely fine and it's uh, something that doesn't engage, it doesn't have, have the engagement. One thing to note also that, is that if you make this content for reward videos, make sure that it is visible in the level, in the UX flow, Mm, so you may want to add some full screen pop-up overlay or like here, make it discoverable very well in the bottom part across the other props uh, to, to select from scroll view. Because if you put it somewhere in the shop in the second tab, nobody will discover it and for sure it will not affect the, the R pool neither. And one extra point to uh, talk about, I didn't put it in the initial form because I know it's not available to everyone, uh, but when you can try to A-B test everything. A hunch is good, but data is real. And uh, only if you A-B test new features, you can clearly know if there has been some improvement over the previous version, because there is something like seasonality effect. Even on a weekly base basis, you have this data fluctuation, which is like a seasonality on a micro level. So when you compare the versions with the different time frames, it's pretty hard to make conclusive results. So we always try to keep the control group exactly the same as the previous version, just to measure the new features within the same time frame. And then we isolate the features per group, because if you start with the combo, then actually you don't really know if uh, feature B was the, affecting the mm, KPIs or feature C because they were together. Maybe actually feature C put down the feature B. So it's always do uh, it's always good to isolate those features. Having said that, you need to consider how uh, big cohorts you you collect every day because it, you can't just put fifty um, groups and uh, acquire like I don't know 100, 100 players per per this group because it will be very noisy data. We also add the second control group because if we measure two control groups together, then you can see that the data is noisy or not if they are showing the same results. So this is something to consider when you can. And if I would like to uh, summarize with a simple single headline, I would say first engage, then monetize. So don't think about money, don't think about, uh, I mean, of course it's a business, It's uh, you need to think about money. Let's scrap that. But in the first place, you need to think about how to engage those players. Because if they are not engaged, you will not get any uh, revenue out of it. So you want your game to feel good with good controls that will increase long, uh, create longer sessions, increase usage time, number of runs the players will play. You want to diversify the content to get higher retention. You may want to get the levels shot. It will improve the level flow, and the player will be most likely, more likely to play another level in a row. And you want to have desirable locked contrast content that will boost your RV impressions. And so that was all I got. Uh, 
think I got it within 20 minutes. Sophia, I think we can go to Q&A. Sure, yeah, let's dive into some questions. We've got quite a few here. So we'll, like with the last talk, I will do my best to see how many we can get through. Uh, but first of all, thank you for such a fascinating talk. So uh, thank Thanks you so all. Much. Thanks for having me. Um, no, thank you for being here. Um, the first question uh, I've got here is, um, how can developers balance the creative side with the practical and financial part of the game? Um, and how would you answer to the people that think hyper-casual hyper games are 100% focused on financials? Uh, I would say always going with the publisher. I know I'm going from the publisher side, so it doesn't feel uh, legit, <laughs> but it's always easier to jump on the market with, with the publisher because it's us who help you acquire the users. It's us who help create, create those videos. So if you go alone, you need to cover all expenses by your own. And this is why there is this pressure deal between the developer and the, and the publisher, because we put lots of uh, cost on our side so we can uh, have a win-win situation in the end. Okay, great. And uh, I'm gonna just go through them in different orders here. So Jonas has asked, in UA for hyper casual games, how important is the ROAS in a specific campaign versus the creation of hype, getting up the ranking lists and getting high amounts of organic users? In and this is all in comparison to mid core and hardcore games. Okay, so I can speak about uh, hyper casual, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. that much into uh, mid core user acquisition. Uh, always, we, when we measure new videos, to be honest, in the first place, it's always about CPI. So return on ad spend, of course, but uh, you uh, hyper casual games usually don't have such big revenue as mid core or hardcore games. So all, you always want to get the CPI very low, and this is the main benchmark. And of course, ROAS are important, and this is the, the key. Uh, but uh, usually, you know what ARPU you have and uh, you try to get around I, i'm not sure if, if i can talk about these kpis to be honest <laughs> in this talk but there is a sweet spot we are setting for ross and this is the benchmark to get the cpi according to the output that we get in the game so yeah we have like a set ross goal and then cpi has to be uh, accordingly lower to the output Fantastic. Okay. Um, like I say, anyone who's seen me on panels or something likes things uh, um, knows that I like actionable things. And there's a question here that um, I'm sure will be of interest to a lot of uh, developers who are in the audience who might be thinking about working with Crazy Labs. So someone has asked, when developers reach out to Crazy Labs to be their publisher, are they expected to have the controls and gameplay balanced? Or is this something they can work with, uh, work together with the publisher, in this case yourselves? So we always collaborate with developers. It's yeah. never brute force. And uh, yeah. I, when I discuss new features with uh, with the team of external developers, publishing developers, we always discuss it together. So it really depends, to be honest, on the developer because uh, I'm working with several teams, and there are developers who are coming more from gaming industry and they have uh, like lots of ideas to put in the game and most of the time there are very good ideas and to be honest if you don't a b test it you can have a hunch that uh, it's gonna be better or worse but it's just the opinion before you get the data on the other hand as i mentioned this is uh, so low entry level that everyone can try this uh, and we get also some games from people who didn't read the games at all before so they are looking forward to us to propose some features or uh, solutions so it really depends i never mm, or nobody in my team tries to brute force anything uh, it usually comes from developer if they expect us to uh, to take it away and propose the features or we discuss it together uh, so yeah, definitely there is a big impact and input from the original developers uh, on, on their game. It's their game. We are just publishing. Yeah, and I'll try and fit in like, maybe two questions, but uh, the, one of the ones I want to fit in definitely is uh, this one about, so someone has asked, you mentioned diversifying the levels, adding new mechanics, etc. 
How can we do that and not become just a usual casual game? Is there a sweet spot that keeps the game hyper casual whilst adding a deeper level of gameplay? And I would say that, yeah, of course, adding complex meta game that would rely on adding in-apps would be like chasing this hot hybrid casual thing that everyone's trying to, to chase <laughs> in, on the market. So it's, although it looked like the complex, this power slide I showed with meta game and all this stuff, but it's to be honest, very simplified version of casual games. So uh, you always want to stick to the core of the game. This is where the game is successful. But even the most satisfying core, it's uh, getting monotonous, monotonous over time. So to break this monotony, you want to justify it here and there with some extra stuff, and then come back to the um, to the initial core loop of the game. So uh, yeah, I would say it's uh, something that is even we don't even require this for initial like day one test, for instance, because if get they kind of they uh, reach day one thresholds without meta game it's no good it's uh, something that has to be reached with the core without all this fancy stuff added on top of the game and only after we meet day one we try to focus on day three day seven kpis and that is the part where those extra mechanics kick in yeah and the last question i'll fit in uh, apologies to everyone else is um Chris has asked, the imminent demise of, hyper, of the hyper-casual market has been predicted almost every year, but each time it gets bigger and stronger, what do you think uh, the future of hyper-casual is? Is there a lot of growth still to come? Do you see interest in evolutions? Uh, yeah, what, what, do you, what do you think about the, the future of the hyper-casual market? Yeah, like, like I said, it's growing every time. It's ridiculously growing. So uh, I would expect, this is my assumption that it's not just uh, just something I am guessing that probably we'll see some new platform that uh, then we can we could be able to port same kind of hyper casual appeal to the masses but maybe it will not be the phone anymore it will be something else like VR glasses that look like Ray Bans or something like that <laughs> I'm pretty sure there is coming a new platform that will be utilized for gaming as well but until this comes hyper casual all the way because this is a genre for non-gamers and most of the world are non-gamers who just want to kill the time we are competing with netflix with uh, consuming news it's something that people want to do in their spare time and most of the people have some spare time to do this Fantastic. Well, thank you, Olaf. That was a really interesting talk. So, uh, thank yeah, you thank so you much. for joining us and being with us here. Thanks a lot, Sofia. It's been great uh, being here. I hope I shared some knowledge and looking forward to the other sessions. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks and yeah, so enjoy the rest of the sessions and the day and the week. <laughs>